Hey, hey, welcome back to another episode of the Lonely Liberal Podcast. I'm your host, Nick Zankin, and I'm so happy to have you here on this lovely Wednesday. we got a great show for you today. We're going to talk about nuclear energy. Basically, is it a good idea or not? We've been hearing a lot of people, you know, murmuring for it more of recent, especially in this uh, Trump administration from both weirdly Gen Z and Republicans. So we're going to go through the pro case, the con case, give you some background information, and then we can make a decision for ourselves. So we got a lot to talk about. So without further ado, let's get to it. So like I said, there's never really been more popularity for nuclear energy than right now, at least in recent years. New Gallup and Pew Poll show there's a 61% support for new nuclear adding capacity and 80% of Gen Z are pro. Now, this does split between party lines for a bit, so Republicans are more around 74, 75% support, whereas Democrats are 45, 46. So there's definitely uh, not only just a public opinion shift, but this is actually becoming a little bit of a politicized issue. And it would be silly to talk about nuclear energy without talking about this historical skepticism that's been built in basically since the Cold War, right? I mean, people in the 70s and 80s, there was all this thought about nuclear catastrophe. There were stories about nuclear meltdowns, Three Mile Island, Chernobyl. There were movies like The China Syndrome. I mean, even recently with Fukushima, that has really freaked people out about reactor issues and nuclear fallout and things of this nature. So honestly, there's more of a distrust from a cultural point of view, just as much at least as there is from a technical point of view. Now, what's interesting is Gen Z wasn't alive during the Cold War, right? So they don't have those historical biases. And in fact, they probably are coming from a more pragmatic, you know, climate change is real. We need all zero emission energy we can. How come we're not looking at this? How come this isn't progressing as much? So you have this interesting kind of cultural and almost political divide now kind of forming in how people view nuclear energy. So where is the U.S. in its nuclear energy journey, right? So there are 54 commercial reactors throughout the country, and they actually generate 20% of all U.S. electricity. The Voctel units 3 and 4 in Georgia, they're the first new reactors in the last 30-ish years, which is nuts. Three Mile Island, like I said, from the famous disaster, it's being restarted with help from Microsoft. And so there are this, you know, new kind of push happening over the last few years. And some of the biggest benefits of nuclear energy, right, is one, it has a very high capacity factor. So how much energy it can produce while it's operating. Nuclear is over 90 percent, which is the highest of all major energy sources. That's pretty cool. And obviously that it has zero emissions. Now... There is this drama with the cost, and it's one of these things that on paper, nuclear has a very, very competitive cost, right? Very manageable operating costs, surprisingly cheap, around 30 bucks a megawatt hour, which is actually pretty good. That being said, okay, in practice, these more recent nuclear developments have gone way over budget. The Vogtel units that I was just talking about cost over $36 billion. The UK's Hinkley Point C, a you know, modern big nuclear project in the United Kingdom, is, is going to cost $48 billion. The original budget was $18 billion, and it's been delayed over five years. Frankly, there's one in Poland, right, be, being built by uh, the U.S. firm Westinghouse. It's going to cost $20 billion, right? And the reason why is permitting, red tape, safety precautions, just technology that is needed to make this thing work. So it's one of those things that if I'm just on a spreadsheet, yeah, nuclear can be very cost efficient. And I think if everything goes well, you could see how it could be. That being said, in at least recent years, these things have gone way over budget and have cost tens of billions of dollars. To put that into perspective, an offshore wind farm in the U.S., which is very expensive, costs you know three to five billion dollars. A oil and gas platform costs two billion dollars. This is like multiples of that. Okay, and. Another thing about nuclear that's interesting is that there's this emerging type of nuclear technology called nuclear nuclear fusion, okay? So the one that we've been using, right, the tech that we use now is called nuclear fission, okay? What that does, right, is it splits uranium into energy and radioactive waste, right? It's reliable, scaled, we know about it, but, you know... It is a waste issue, right? There's nuclear radioactive waste getting emerged while you use it, right? 
Nuclear fusion, on the other hand, this new technology, it what it does is it fuses hydrogen atoms together, and that creates energy with no long-lived waste or meltdown risk. The thing is, it's still in the R&D phase, and it's been something that we've been hearing about over the last five-ish years, like, oh, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And in fact, we had a really big breakthrough in California a few years back where they actually were able to make net positive energy from uh, nuclear fusion, which was really exciting. It was for like a half a second, way less, like a millisecond, but it's still a big deal. And this is something that you hear about in politics because there is this a lot of hope for this. So you'll see funding programs. You'll hear about China funding nuclear programs. But we have seen progress here in the U.S. There's the Commonwealth Fusion Systems. They've been saying that they're going to have energy by 2027. There's a big project happening in France. They think it's going to happen anytime soon. But there isn't none, right? There is no nuclear fusion plant. So whenever someone's talking about, you know, active nuclear, like what's actually being used, they're talking about fission. If they're talking about kind of the futuristic, more cutting edge version, it's fusion, right? And well, the cost issues that I talked about a second ago, of course, are a big issue, right? We don't want to spend tens of billions of dollars on energy if there are other better ways. The real thing that makes everyone shiver, right, is waste, safety, and just trust. And it is important to think about this from how far have we come since the 70s and 80s when things really kind of were melting down, literally, right? There's been a lot more safety protocols put into place as recently as last year right there was a law in 2024 that creates federal nuclear waste uh, sorry which creates a federal nuclear waste agency it had bipartisan support you know MIT other universities they're pretty comfortable with the idea that this can be safe i mean there's a uh, facility in new mexico that has been storing waste since 1999 with no issues right and the truth is, right, there has been zero deaths from U.S. commercial nuclear accidents. The, n the new reactors have passive safety. So what that means is they don't need external power to cool. And really what it is is that these old disasters were more about governance, not physics. Okay, so like bad practice. So – that being said, you know, the Hanford site in Washington, which is a World War II era cleanup, it's still going, right? There really is something to be worried about with radiation, cancer, sabotage. This is all emotional, but it is terrifying, right? I mean, you know, people talk about wind turbines, right? Like, oh, I wouldn't, I hate them, they're ugly. Or even oil and gas, oh, they're ugly. You want to talk about not in my backyard. You <laughs> have a nuclear reactor in your neighborhood. You feel comfortable? You probably should, but I totally understand why you wouldn't. I certainly wouldn't. So I think in summary, I think you could say we actually have progressed a lot in terms of making sure nuclear facilities are safer, but there really is a cultural, emotional hurdle that we'll have to get through. And the other thing is more of a kind of international relations or kind of more philosophical argument, but I think worth talking about. And the question is, is – Who's allowed to have nuclear energy? Obviously, we're talking about the United States, but can Iran have nuclear energy? Can North Korea have nuclear energy? Poland, we could have, you know, but why not this and why not that? And the reason, obviously, is that if an uh, adversary of the United States starts developing nuclear energy, you get suspicious. Oh, my God, what if they're going to make nuclear weapons, yada, yada, yada. And we have the Nuclear Proliferation Treaty, right, which allows nuclear – energy productions with oversight. Now, the people who have signed this already all kind of have nuclear weapons, so they're fine, but it does take into consideration, right? You, I mean, you should probably take it into consideration how do we govern entering new countries into this organization and how do we monitor this without it getting out of control? Because in one hand, in one hand, climate needs are definitely global, but we definitely don't trust everyone, right? So fusion, the new technology, would dodge this issue, but like I said, we're not really there yet. All in all, nuclear energy is interesting because it hasn't really gotten the financial support that a lot of Republicans have said they want to give it, especially in this more modern uh, – especially in the Trump 2025 administration, right? It's – one of those things that gets praises from the right and center, but 
as soon as subsidies come up, they get really quiet, right? So obviously in the big, beautiful bill, we did a whole episode on this, this slashes clean energy support. It actually expands oil and gas benefits, but doesn't do anything for nuclear. It keeps it the same, right? So fossil fuels are still getting more subsidies than nuclear energy is. Not just more subsidies than clean energy. I'm talking about nuclear as well. So, you know, you attack renewables, you attack nuclear for needing help, yet here we are, you know, like with fossil fuels getting a ton. So it's interesting. It's one of those examples where you can't really get people to actually have a real opinion because they're just like, well, you know, it sounds good. But then when it actually comes to subsidizing new technologies and making it affordable, just like renewables, we've been seeing a lot of crickets. So in summary, I guess you could say, what's the pro case? It's low carbon, reliable baseload power. You can solve the waste issue. The safety is better than ever. And fission is here now, but fusion could be next, and we need to press forward. The case against it, it's expensive. It's hard to build quickly. Politics and public fear still a huge obstacle for its development. And fusion is pretty speculative at the moment. What do I think, <laughs> right? One of these shows always kind of boiled down to, what do I think? Ah, it's definitely not perfect, right? But I think it might be essential. I think we're going to have to just kind of bite the bullet a little bit in the sense that it's definitely scary, but can we really afford to ignore it, right? And it's interesting because in order to justify subsidizing nuclear energy the way that we would have to, you'd have to believe in climate change, right? Just like you do with the reasons for subsidizing clean energy, right? So it's interesting that some people, some people in this comments of videos that I've made and have written in are pro-nuclear but anti-renewables because they point to the, you know, all the capacity factor and stuff like that. But the economics of them alone, especially with what's actually happened in practice, don't really work without subsidies. So if you're gonna subsidize energy for the reason of, emissions, you might as well, you should feel logically comfortable subsidizing them all. So it's one of those things that it's definitely part of the mix, right? And um, we've seen countries like France, you know, power their entire rail system basically with it. We've seen the benefits that, you know, a good nuclear program can have, but there is a definite cultural, political, kind of moral issues and safety issues and security issues that will need to be addressed before it's this kind of easy kind of get out of jail free thing that I think a lot of potentially Gen Z folks or maybe, uh, you know, more cynical folks can kind of think. So that's our show, folks. Thank you so much for listening today. What do you think? Write me in at the lonely liberal podcast at gmail.com, YouTube comment, all this stuff. I'm curious what you guys think, because it is one of those interesting things that, you know, you could see both sides of the story. So I'm, I'm interested in to hear what everyone thinks. If you like the show, give it a like, subscribe, five-star review. All of this stuff really helps, and I really appreciate it if you do it. We'll be back on Sunday to talk about this week's news with Rick, and I look forward to talking to you then. See you. Bye.